Lydia Gill, um, and I am the Assistant Director in Career Services. Um, within our career office, one of the particular areas that we help students with is preparing and exploring and applying to graduate and professional school. And we have really seen um, appointments for this topic in high demand and continue to be in high demand over the last uh, five to 10 years. So uh, for this reason, that's why we um, have a wonderful Carol alumna, Caitlin Williams with us here tonight, um, really to share her experiences and her uh, process uh, for what she's um, gone through in her professional school journey. Um, as well. So we hope that you have some direct takeaways that really can be positive for your experience. So I'm going to just kick off with um, a short uh, bio of Caitlin before we kind of turn it over and, and go back and forth with some question and answer. So a little bit about Caitlin here. Caitlin grew up in Grand Rapids, Michigan, before attending Carroll University for her Bachelor of Science in Biology and Chemistry. Um, Caitlin's family has many connections back to this university. Her parents met at Carroll. Uh, she had several uncles who also attended here. Um, since then, her younger brother um, has been here and several other cousins as well. And she also met her husband, Nihal Studden, who's now a physical therapist with Under Armour. Um, Caitlin is currently an MD PhD candidate in the Garza Laboratory at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, where she studies cell biology, dermatology, and innate immunology in the context of hydratinitis suppurativa, an inflammatory skin disease. She'll return to medical school this summer, where she uh, will complete her MD and move on to a residency. Outside of work and school, Caitlin enjoys spending time with her husband and their dog Culver, who is of course named for the food chain that is very sadly unavailable on the East Coast. I feel that. Um, <laughs> she also enjoys hiking, painting, and reading. She has been involved with several other types of work, including graphic design, sustainability initiatives, and serving on admissions committees for both graduate and medical school, which we are certainly going to ask Caitlin about her experience for that with some advice. So Caitlin, thank you again so much for joining us tonight. Um, before we get uh, started with some of our question answer, Caitlin, because some people may not be familiar with the MD PhD pathway, do you mind sharing just a quick overview as well as what are some career outcomes um, for that particular uh, area of expertise. Sure, yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to see everyone. I will drop my email in the chat at some point, just so you know, you're welcome to email me at any time with any questions. So MD-PhD, it's exactly what it sounds like. Um, it's usually an eight year program. You get an MD and a PhD. So you go through the first years of medical school, you take some time off, you do your PhD, which is what I'm finishing up now. And then you go back to medical school for the last two years. Um, the benefit of this program, as opposed to doing them separately is that they pay for everything and I'm actually stipend supported. So I have no, student loans for medical school, and I'm actually paid to attend medical school and graduate school, which is very nice. Um, kind of the point of these programs is to produce physician scientists, which again, exactly what it sounds like. Um, physicians who also run laboratory or run lab experiments, clinical trials, that kind of thing. Um, kind of the main goal, I think these are NIH funded programs, the National Institutes of Health. So they really like to see people go into academics. So becoming faculty at medical schools or other places that do medical research and also see patients. Um, but our, especially Hopkins and most other schools are pretty open to you doing kind of whatever you want. I know several people who ended up in kind of leadership positions at the FDA, other government positions, the NIH, as well as biotech. Um, actually, I'm currently wearing a Patagonia that was gifted to every member of the current program by an alumna or an alumnus who became a, a venture capitalist. So he makes a lot of money. But yeah, so you're really open. It's a really flexible kind of dual degree. So it's really nice in that sense. Wonderful. Thank yeah. you. And I think that will go right into kind of our first question, which Emma, do you mind sharing? sharing um, the PowerPoint slides, just so folks will have an idea, especially on the rewatch of what question we're on. I think that would be awesome. Absolutely. Can you see my screen? Yes, it looks Perfect. good. Awesome. Right. Okay. So, um, Caitlin, I think what we're going to start off with is, I, I think this will be a great segue from just um, how you described 
um, what the program is that you're in currently. But if we go to that next slide, Emma, I think really the first question we can talk about, and for you, Caitlin, it's the specific MD-PhD pathway. For some of our other uh, listeners and watchers of this event, it may not be that same exact pathway, but just wondering if you can share a little bit about how you explored different types of programs, different uh, medical or research specialties, and how did you know and feel validated that that was really going to be the right fit for you in terms of your career goals? Yeah, so I came into college really liking science. I knew I wanted to do something related to the life sciences. Um, my dad runs a lab in kind of molecular biology, so I was exposed to that pretty early on. Um, I started working with Sue Lewis, who's a biology professor at Carroll, love Sue, um, and we worked on kind of invasive ecology, and I really enjoyed that, but I found I kind of wanted to do more things that are more, more medical related. Um, so during the summer, the first summer after my freshman year, I worked in kind of a medical biology laboratory in Boston, really enjoyed it, and at that point I was thinking more just PhD, just do research. I really loved research, that's kind of what I wanted to do. Um, but I ended up having a mentor in one of my summer um, kind of rotation summer internships while working in a lab who was an MD and really encouraged me to think about also doing both. Um, these programs are kind of built for people who want to see patients but do research. So the question at that point was, do I want to see patients? Um, so I did some shadowing. I talked to a lot of different people in both different careers. Um, there was also the aspect that if you want to do medical research, it's easier to get access to patient samples if you have an MD. So things like running clinical trials, which I really enjoy and is something that we do in my lab now, that was way more plausible with an MD. You don't need both of these degrees to do it, but if you know you want to run a lot of research, you know, do a lot of science and you want to see patients, this is kind of the degree for you. And that's kind of what I wanted to do. So that's how I decided. I love hearing kind of how you went into things or how you originally thought you were going to go one pathway with research and then through shadowing and through conversations with professionals, they really helped guide you to figure out, hey, this is an area. You know, before someone suggested the MD PhD pathway, did you know that that was an option? Were you familiar with that at all? I was not at all, which is also oh. funny because my dad is a, a PI PhD. And he, when I brought it up, then he was like, yes, I've heard of this, but it's pretty niche. So it's yeah. not something that a lot of people have heard of. Um, I think it's more common kind of in the big one R1 research universities. So like if I went to University of Wisconsin, perhaps I would have heard of it earlier, but ultimately I don't think it changed much of my pathway. So that's, I just, I love that. I think that really shows the power of networking and talking to people, getting out in the world, taking opportunities and uh, meeting people that, yeah, then start to tell you about these things. In career development, we call them found careers or found majors. So, you know, when we're young, we know of careers like a firefighter or a policeman or a nurse, because those are what we see. But probably we're not thinking about who are the people who are researching disease and all of those things. So such a wonderful and impactful program you're in. So that's great. So let's go to this next topic. Um, this is a question I get asked about a lot. And Caitlin, I know that you applied to uh, quite a few programs, but also you were sort of limited just on who had the MD PhD pathways as well. Mm -hmm. But can you talk a little bit about if you know you're providing advice to someone talking about do you just apply to every single program that you can, but knowing mm -hmm. that's time and money, or yeah. do you only apply to three programs or a, just a smaller quantity? So what are some of your thoughts about this quality quantity discussion? Yeah, so I think it's also, this is going to become an annoying theme, but it's very personal based. So this is going to be based on like what kind of a program you're applying to and also you and your values. Mm -hmm. So like when I was applying to programs, I was 20 years old. I matriculated when I was 21 to Hopkins. Um, I wasn't thinking about, do I need to be in your family? Am I going to have a child soon? Like, where will my future husband work? Like these things were just not really on my mind. Um, if I was applying, I'm very happy with my choice now. It worked out great. If I was applying again today at 20, I'm currently 27, I'll be 29 when I graduate here. Kids, 
child care family is going to be way more important, something I think about more. Um, so if you are someone who's geographically constrained, we call this, um, that's pretty common, actually. So you need to be in a certain area for your family. Maybe you only apply to five schools um, mm -hmm. and that's OK. It's more just you have to decide for yourself what kind of risks you're willing to take and, of course, how much money are you willing to spend? Um, are you willing to maybe knock it in one year and try again next year? Or is it something you want to start now? Um, I think the general advice I give to people, I give a lot of people application advice, especially for medical school. And I think it's also looking at your application and having a good hard look at it and asking yourself how competitive you are and for what kind of programs you're competitive for. Um, for example, if you want to go to medical school, but you're not really interested in research, that's totally okay. Like we need lots of doctors who do community practice, um, but maybe you don't apply to as many kind of the, those schools that are research heavy because that's not really something that's reflected in your application and that's not really where you want to go um so just like have a hard look at yourself and ask yourself what you really want and also what you're competitive for um, I often tell people to pick, I would say, at least five schools that are middle of the road for you, like they match your st stats for GPA and MCAT if you're in medical school, or just GPA for whatever entrance exam for your particular program. Pick like five of those. That's usually a pretty reasonable number. If you're geographically constrained, focus on those areas. And then if you have the money and like the willpower, because writing applications is exhausting mm -hmm. um you know throw in a couple more schools that you're like oh if i got in here it would be great but i'm not expecting to yeah i love that yeah, we kind of sometimes i give the advice of three different categories like those dream schools your reach schools the ones you really feel confident about and then the ones you feel really confident on like i exceed all of their uh application expectations and things mm -hmm. so i love that but i just um I, I want to sort of uh, just rehash exactly what you just talked about, Caitlin, with the are you a competitive candidate and taking a hard look. Do you mind sharing if you have any particular pieces of the application? You know, some things are quantitative, like mm -hmm. you need to have a minimum of this many hours of shadowing or things. So you kind of know. But any other particular pieces on how does someone gauge if they're competitive or not? I know that's a really sort of gray area question, but any particular yeah. areas where a student could look and say, I should take a look at these different areas of the application? Right. So the easy ones are obviously like GPA and like entrance exam scores. So I think like you and other people are probably pretty good at helping people with that. Yeah. Um, I would say if you've done anything that is not listed in your transcript, these can, and like we have a, I think that we're going to talk about this later, so I don't want to go over it too much now, but really you don't have to target everything you do towards this particular goal in the end of the day, because people and programs really like to see that you do other things that you're not just like a one track mind who only cares about getting into whatever kind of program you want to get into. Mm -hmm. um, so especially long term things. So like if you have painted for 10 years, that's super cool. It's not going to be listed anywhere as a transcript. You might not have won any awards or have anything official to show it but that's still something that's really cool and that people like to see um when i got interviewed i basically only talked about my hobbies in at least half the interviews that's very common um mm -hmm. because everybody has you know a certain gpa and a certain mcat score or whatever score and most people who applying to medical school have some research that gets really boring to talk about after a while so really anything that you can think of that you've had a long-term experience doing anything that makes you interesting anything you would talk to someone at a speed date for or at the bar about out, like something like that. That's all good. Yeah, I love that. That's good. And uh, Caitlin, just one more uh, topic in this area. Um, I know that you didn't take a gap year, um, but obviously for medical school, that is that is fairly common, or sometimes folks will even get a master's mm -hmm. before going to medical school. For a lot of programs like PA that are really competitive at this point, gap years are very common. Um, but I, I think I'd love to hear your thoughts about what are uh, different activities that you think folks can be doing during those gap years that may help with the competitiveness of their application? Yeah, for sure. So I did not, I'll tell you my reasoning for not taking a gap year first, which is that yeah. I looked at my application. I had a couple other trusted, you know, senior adults, other people in medical school look at my application and asked, is a gap year going to give me anything? Is it going to make me any better? And in my case, I was like, I don't think it's going to increase my competitiveness very much. Um, and I also don't think that I'm undecided. If you're undecided about where to go, I think a gap year is great. Um, you can 
stop paying money for a degree, um, get some real adult experience, maybe go out in the world, have a vacation, you know? Um, so that's one reason to do it. If you look at your application and think, I think I could do something in a gap year to make me more competitive or competitive for a particular program that I have my sights on, I think it's a, a good idea. Um, I tend to caution people away from master's programs, actually, because some master's programs are great um, for going into certain things. If it's like a terminal degree, you want a master's of education for a particular thing. That's a great example. If you're getting a master's of like biotechnology or a master of science with the goal of getting into medical school, it's just as good to do a gap year in a lab and do medical research or a gap year in a clinical environment where you work as like a receptionist or something similar like that. And then you don't have to pay for it. Um, Cause I think a lot of times people are paying tens of thousands of dollars for these master's programs when you would be better off or even better kind of a DIY gap year. A lot of people do something like the NIH post back. Um, there are official post backs as well. Some of those are great and some of them are not as great. You just have to do a little bit of research to figure out which ones would work for you. And if you want to live somewhere for a year or two, that's also a reason I've seen people do that. Great answer, Caitlin. I love it because I always tell folks going to graduate school when you're not sure what to do, that is the most expensive career exploration you can do. You yeah. might as well make money than pay someone to, to be in a program. So right. I, I love hearing that. So wonderful. Well, let's keep talking about competitiveness with our next section here about um, compiling a competitive application. Mm -hmm. um, so especially we know we have some folks joining us live who are first and second year students, which I love to see mm -hmm. because as you know, apply even just the application for graduate and professional school is like a full-time job while you're still in school and likely doing other jobs so let's talk a little bit and and i know actually at the beginning you did talk briefly so can you just go over a few um experiences that you prioritize throughout your college degree because it's not just that six months leading up to when you apply it's the years um leading up to that so if you can yeah just share a little bit more about those experiences yeah, so um, I think I'll start with, so to start with what I did, um, I think research was the biggest thing that I did that was on my application. Again, I'm in a very research heavy program, right? Half my degree is a PhD in medical research. So that maybe that's not you and that's okay. I, I do want to reiterate that everything, however you're doing it is going to be fine. Like I think people stress out way too much about stuff like this. And sometimes it's good to just like take a breath and be like, everybody has an individual application and yours is not going to look like the guy from Harvard and that's okay. Um, so I did a lot of research. I did a lot of invasive ecology research with Sue Lewis um, that started my freshman year, but I didn't start that. Um, I want to emphasize with the goal of going into an MD PhD program. I started that experience with the goal of doing something I really like to do. Um, it was my on campus job and having a mentor, Dr. Lewis, who I really, really liked talking to and who was a big help to me personally and professionally. Um, so I think if you have any kind of experience that you're currently doing or have already started, having a long term experience experience, regardless of what it is, is really, really valuable. So for example, when I review applications and I sit at the panel with all of the faculty members and we discuss applicants, if you did something that was meaningful to you, but not necessarily relevant to your topic or degree for four years versus doing something relevant for a year and a half, the first one is going to look way better. Um, they just like to see that you can start something, enjoy it, be committed to it, and continue through several years of work. Um, my biggest thing was research, and I just kind of lucked out a little bit because that's what I decided I wanted to do with my career. But I also know people um, in my MD cohort anyway. Most of my MD PhD cohort was very research heavy, as you might guess, but there are many people that were in my MD cohort who did very little research. Um, some of them did like robotics all through four years. I have a particular um, friend who did robotics for four years in college. It's like a club activity. He put it on his application and he ended up applying it to medical things. So he kind of programmed these robots that go around the aquarium that children in the children's hospital can control and go see the aquarium that way. So I think the biggest thing here is if you have something you enjoy doing and is it doesn't have to be relevant. I think the idea that it has to be directly connected to your degree is not true. Um, I would much rather talk to you about your cool hobby or this thing you did that not every other applicant does, if that is helpful at all. I think all of that is really helpful, Caitlin. Um, 
So you mentioned that you, uh, you know, are looking at applicants as a part of the admissions committee. One question that sometimes I'll get from students that they're really concerned about is while they're in undergrad, they're worried about gaps on their resume, which in my purview is more so about someone who is out of school and employed. And then we, you know, there's a, there's a lot of layers to that question, but just for you, if you can share, because you you are on the admissions committee, is that anything that you ever look at to see if they have three months or two months where they weren't working according to their resume? No, I mean, you guys are so young, you're in school. It's not a big thing. Um, the only thing I could think of that I would be like, I just wonder what happened is if you were working like in a research lab and then suddenly stopped and started working in another research lab. And that could be as simple as I found something I was more interested in, mm -hmm. um, or it could be like my PI kicked me out of the first lab. So like, right. it's very easily explainable though, but no, I've never even thought about that. Okay, good. I, I know sometimes I get asked questions. And I think, wow, that's a, that is a really great question. And I have an understanding, but sometimes they may have been talking with someone outside of their field or their industry that might be or, you know, 20 years older that, again, are looking at different things as a hiring manager. So yeah. wonderful. All right, we'll go next into another significant part of the application process, which is the personal statement, the motivation statement. There's lots of different words for this, but mm -hmm. um, it's not uncommon. I, I would say now more days we're seeing more prompts being given um, for different programs, but if someone is not given a prompt for their general personal statement, what are some experiences or different categories that you really think that everyone, regardless of their specialty of program they're applying to, should include on those personal statements? Yeah, I think first of all, having like a single narrative is much preferable than to having like a bullet type uh, personal statement. And I beg you to please just proofread it and make sure your punctuation is correct. You would not believe how many people submit applications with just really poor grammar. That's number one. Um, and I, I, you know, I think maybe the things I've seen that I've really enjoyed reading are a time somebody's had their mind changed. That's been a couple of great personal statements that I've read. Um, there's so many people who write like reasons why they're interested in the career. And I think that's fine, but I think it tends to end up all blurring together and sounding the same like I want to be a PA or a doctor or this or that because I want to help people it's like so does everyone like maybe like it's fine to include that in your personal statement but maybe just something a little bit more more unique um so a time you changed your mind I've seen a couple of those that were really really good and they kind of tied it into personality and why they wanted to do this career um or a time that you saw something in the real world that applied to what you had learned in like an academic setting. I've read a couple good ones like that because I feel like a lot of times what you learn in class or in medical school doesn't feel like it applies to really anything. Um, and then someday you like have a situation where you're like, oh, wow, this actually was really helpful and helped me a lot. Um, I feel like nowadays most of them are like why medicine or why PA or why PT. Um, so I think the ones that usually stand out the most are like personal experiences taught like told as a narrative um, that are more of a story than anything else. Those are the ones that tend to do well. I like that. We have a common phrase in our office of, of show, don't tell. So we want to see skills demonstrated. We don't just want a list of I can communicate and I can work on a team. We want to hear hear those experiences and see those related. Yeah, um, yeah I, I think what you said is is great. Um, let's see, any anything else you can think of, Caitlin? Just general pieces. Again, you now did you have a centralized application system when you were applying for med school? We did. Yeah, the okay. AMCAS system. Okay, and there's lots of different one. There's PTCAS, OTCAS, CASPA. Any, um, I guess one thing I want to ask you is sometimes I'll, I'll get asked this in our office as well about if there is something strange or the application isn't working or a school has asked for something specific, mm -hmm. um, how would you approach reaching out to a school with a question about applications? Do you think that that's something that someone should just try to figure out on their own? Um, or is it is it appropriate to reach out to an admission staff or a faculty member um, just with more of those general logistical questions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, just how would you approach that maybe for someone who had a question? Um, I mean, if you can find the answer online, do not email anyone about it. I, mm -hmm. We 
apparently that's happened a lot. Like, um, is so and so a prerequisite for this medical school? And it's like you can Google this. Like, you don't need to email somebody. Um, if you're having a very specific issue, I think it's okay to email people. The admissions directors and admissions counselors. That's their job is to be, you know, kind of the go between for admissions. If you're really stuck, I think it's totally fine to email an admissions person. Um, if it's like a technical issue with the centralized service start with the AMCAS or whatever the centralized services because they like pay people so much money to run these services so like somebody will help you um it's totally fine to email for stuff like that I think yeah awesome thank you good all right well, let's go on to the next piece which is my personal favorite part but maybe it's my favorite because I'm not the one actually having to do all the interviews um so yeah we'll go to this first question here um and so this question really, because again, I know a little bit about your personal process, Caitlin, and that you were offered quite a few interviews. Um, and so how did you prepare yourself with some things that you knew that would be asked likely at all interviews? And then what were some things that you felt like you had to prepare for program to program? Yeah, so um for all interviews, you can find a lot of lists online. I think a lot of different kinds of programs do a similar thing, like behavioral questions. So like, tell me about a time you failed. Tell me about a time you were in conflict. Um, there's a couple of those. And I think it's good to not even like fully rehearse it maybe, but just like think about it. Just like have a story in mind for these questions because you will probably get to ask them at some point. You'll get some really off the wall things like what kind of fruit would you be if you were a fruit? I got asked that in an interview. Um, some other really weird ones. And those are more just to see how you deal with like conversations under pressure. And I think especially in healthcare, these are questions they ask to kind of gauge how you deal with not difficult, but kind of off the wall social situations because the social aspect of medicine is very important. Um, so those are things you could prepare. Like there are lists everywhere online. I'm sure Lydia probably has a list as well of like common behavioral interview questions. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, for me, it was way more conversational. So these people who are interviewing you, remember they're interviewing dozens of people, if not hundreds, they've read hundreds of applications. They just want to have a conversation with you a lot of times and see how you are as a person. Um, for the most part, they just want to make sure you're normal. Um, I know that sounds really weird, but they just want to make sure you can talk to a normal person like a normal person. That's a really big thing. You'd be surprised how many people cannot do that or even fake it for 20 minutes. Um, so if you can do that, you're already ahead of the curve, I think. And then for individual programs, one thing you can do if you're applying to different programs is look up the mission statement of the program you're going to. They're all fairly interchangeable, to be honest, but if a particular program is like, we really value service or giving back to the community, and another program is like, we really like research, um, you can kind of tailor your answers to questions based on that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something I did. For me, personally, I interviewed with um, faculty who do research, so I would Google the person beforehand, see what kind of research they did, just so I had some kind of... Uh, starting point to talk about what they did specifically. What's a really good um, cheat code is if you are stuck or a lot of times they'll be like, do you have any questions for me? Like two minutes into the interview, which is very annoying. Um, if you know anything about that person, you can be like, what's an exciting thing that's going on in your lab or what's an exciting thing that's going on kind of in your classroom right now? And that can be, you can get them to talk for a long time about stuff like that. So that's something I also use quite a bit. Yeah. Caitlin, if, if you were interviewing um, a candidate for Johns Hopkins, what do you think would be positive things or things that you would like to hear if you ask them the question, why do you want to be at Johns Hopkins? It's a good question. I think generally, so the mission of Hopkins is a big part is research. So people who talk about wanting to not just be good doctors, but also maybe try and change medicine for the better to try and find new treatments or try to connect people with new treatments that they wouldn't otherwise get maybe in a more rural setting or in a non-academic setting. Um, honestly, with Hopkins interviews, and I think probably this is the case for a lot of like you know, top schools, I don't want to say that these schools are better than others. They just have higher um, quantifiable stats a lot of the time. But for a lot of these people, um, because they have such high MCAT scores and GPAs and they have all these things, I'm like, are you normal or are you a robot? Like if you're talking to a patient, are they going to feel taken care of? Are they going to feel like you're sympathetic to them? Um, so that's honestly what I look for the most. And this is pretty common with student interviewers is just the vibe of the person is what we look at a lot. So just be, you know, a nice 
fun person to talk to, be able to talk about different things. Um, and I will caution everybody that your first interview is going to be the worst. It's going to feel terrible. It's okay. Um, I still got accepted to my first interview, but you will get better over time. Yeah, I love that. And uh, thanks for sharing that, Caitlin, and, and being really honest about it. Because sometimes when you have the option, um, if students are scheduling multiple interviews, sometimes we will talk and try to strategize to say, what are your top programs? Can we schedule them, you know, a couple interviews in so that you get a few practice questions with maybe those uh, those schools that you're maybe not as excited. Of course, you'll, you'll, you know, maybe still get an offer there, but yeah, so that you get some practice. Cause I really think as many mock interviews as you can do, there's nothing like the real thing. Um, yeah. And you might get some programs, some med schools do this. I think some PA programs do this. There are like mixed multi interviews or mini interview series. I had a couple panel interviews, which is where I sat or I stood in front of six PIs and they interviewed me as a panel. That was terrifying. Yeah. Um, but you're going to get different kinds of interviews and you'll do okay. I think the biggest thing is just try not to get too nervous. I know it's hard, but just not being nervous, I think is the biggest asset. Yeah, I think that's great. Well, let's go to this next question, which goes right into what you were just talking about, Caitlin, which is, can you give some different types of aspects of those interview days? Because for some students, they can be quite surprised that interview days might be six or eight hours, but that isn't that unusual for a lot of these programs, especially, I think, Caitlin, your experiences are great because you often were flying out to these other programs. Um, one thing I do want to say, uh, just to clarify for some folks, since COVID and the pandemic, where there was a lot of virtual interviewing, some things have changed. So, Caitlin, you interviewed, uh, you must have been interviewing in like 17, 18, right? 2017, 2018. Um, and now you might be able to also talk about if anything has changed and stayed the same now at Hopkins, mm -hmm. um, if you do any virtual interviewing. So uh, please feel free to share about what your days were like. And then, yeah, if you've seen any changes or if Hopkins is back to, you know, we do everything in person or, or things like that. I think that will be great for folks to hear. Yeah, so my interviews were actually two days um, in person when I went because I was interviewed by both PhD commission committees and MD committees most of the time and often also a third committee, which was the dual degree committee. Um, so my interview days were long, like eight hours a day for two days, um, usually included at least a dinner and a lunch that you dress professional for and they say they're not evaluating you, but they are evaluating you. Um, so mine were quite long. I was surprised. Um, I think I mentioned how conversational most of my interviews were. Um, this might also be because these programs are quite small. There's only 12 people a year um, in my program at Hopkins. I think the biggest MD-PhD cohort in the country is 20 per year. Um, so they're quite small. So they're not quite as assembly aligned for things like PA schools and uh, kind of normal medical schools, graduate schools. Um, you might be looking more at canned interview questions just because they got to get through so many people. Um, but for me, I was surprised by how conversational people were. I was actually surprised that people actually read my application. I was kind of assuming I was going to walk in and they will have no idea who I was. And that did happen a few times. But I also had people who had like highlighted things on my application. So please don't lie on your resume or your CV or anything because they do read those. So if you say you're conversational in Spanish and you walk in, there's a pretty a fairly good likelihood they will put you with someone who speaks Spanish. Um, that I've seen that happen before. And I've seen people who obviously spoke Spanish and people who obviously lied about being able to speak Spanish. It's just like, don't lie about anything. Don't lie about being a painter. And then you'll get paired with someone who really enjoys painting and you don't know what gouache paint is. I've seen that happen too. Um, so I was surprised by that. So the virtual versus in-person has been a big topic of discussion, both at the medical school, graduate school, and actually residency interview level, which is the step that comes after medical school. Everything is still virtual. Um, I will say that most PDs, which is a program director, do not particularly like it. Um, they find it harder to screen people for these normal person vibes on Zoom. Um, and it's also kind of exhausting to just be staring at a Zoom camera all day for both the applicants and the interviewers. I have not heard anything about switching it. It's also an uh, equitable issue. So it's far cheaper to do a Zoom interview, which is why they haven't switched it back. I do not think they're going to switch it back to in-person within the next two years. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think a lot of schools are saving money 
uh, by having it virtually. And but yeah, I definitely agree with you on the equity issues as well as um, yeah, just the sort of you lack some of those interpersonal skills that you could gauge when you're in person for sure. Um, so just a, a question about virtual interviewing. I mean, we're doing a webinar tonight. And even when Emma and Caitlin and I were talking, when I didn't have my headphones in, then they said, oh, Lydia, you're sounding kind of echoey. I think that was a perfect example on some of these things that you might wanna be prepping for ahead of time. So Caitlin, do you have any just quick tips about virtual interviewings or even faux pas, like things that you've seen that have not been good and stood out to you? That, that might be easier to think of. So we'll try to think of more positive than negative, but just some specific things um, about backgrounds or noise or other things, just to really help people set up for sex success because we're really seeing a large majority of these grad school interviews being virtual. Now, even Marquette, for example, which for context for those uh, listening or maybe rewatching, is about a 20 minute drive from Carroll. But even most of those uh, interviews we've seen are also virtual, even for our local students. Yeah, so I think most of this is going to be common sense, but again, you'd be surprised. So things like do your absolute best to find a quiet environment. I understand it's hard. Um, sometimes I know at Hopkins, we have rooms that you can reserve um, for Zooming. I assume Carol has something similar. If you need to virtually interview Lydia saying yes. Um, so that's great. So always feel free to take advantage of that. I've seen a lot of things that's like, if you have a potted plant in the background, you'll do better. And like, if that makes you feel better, sure, go for it. Uh, it does not make a difference to us. You can, maybe it's subliminal, I'm not sure, but it, it has not made a difference for background. Um, I guess my only thing would be try not to have just like a billion things in the background. Like don't have your bed with dirty clothes in the background piled on top of it. One of these common sense things, but again, be surprised. Um, yeah, that's basically the best thing I can think of. It's always fun or not fun, but good to do a dry run, like zoom with your friend first, make sure your audio is okay. Make sure there's nothing weird going on. Make sure your, your computer is updated before you up, like open it and suddenly you can't get on the zoom link. Um, but for the most part, people have been fairly understanding and most of the things that go wrong come from the faculty side, not the interviewer side or interviewee side. So I want to worry too much about it. Yes. And that's a great way to show your patience, you know, to the interview committee as well. I love that, Caitlin. I would say one thing I didn't realize, um, we were doing some uh, recorded video interview practice with a class of students and someone had a ceiling fan that you could see go around and around and around. And I finally had to stop watching it and just listen. So yeah. it's even little things like that can that can really make a big difference on someone's experience of you visually and audio, of course, as well. Audio is a big piece. Sometimes you can be okay, at least on a rewatch or a recorded interview, you know, things like that with uh, visual issues, but audio can be, if they can't understand you, then that's that's hard to do as well. Yeah, so. and always like never be afraid to use the call-in option on Zoom, like the thing where you can call in on your phone, usually that audio is better. Um, we've had yeah. people do that a couple times and it's been fine. Yeah, I like yeah. that, that's great. Um, Caitlin, uh, just wanna go back to the second piece of this question. Was there anything that surprised you? I don't know if you were given itineraries for your interview days where you kind of knew where you were going to be and you were gonna mm -hmm. be toured around with a, you know, with a guide. But was there anything, either a type of interview or, or something else that really took you off guard and you had to sort of cope and navigate that on the spot? Some of these MMI interviews, which are like the multi mini interviews can be really weird. Um, the one I'm thinking of is they had us go again in person. So you go into a, a room, there's a faculty member there with like a clipboard and they're grading you on something that you don't know. And you go and you sit back to back with another applicant and one of you has instructions for a knot and one of you has a rope and then you have to describe using just your words how to tie this fancy knot. We did not get it right. Um, however, we both got into that program. So I think it's mostly just, you know, most of these things boil down to seeing how you interact on an interpersonal level with people. That's very important to programs. Um, maybe even up there with like academic success would be interpersonal relationships and your ability to do things like that. That one threw me for a loop. What kind of fruit you are kind of threw me. I should have guessed there would be something like that because I had heard of that. Um, I can't remember what fruit I said I was. Maybe it was what kind of food. I think I said I was a ravioli. So it was what kind of food would you be? But those were the big ones. I was more surprised at how much chiller the interviews were than I was expecting. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's a great thing to point out because I've heard that from students as well, that um, sometimes it's when interviews are more informal than they expected. It's harder for them to navigate versus if they're more formal. I think we're always kind of, kind of expecting them to feel cold and uh, not feel that warmth of sort of person to person. And then they're not quite sure how to interact and be that their regular selves right. um, when they feel more comfortable. Actually, something else I would say is um, a lot of times you're probably, especially medical school, graduate school, you're going to get asked, do you have any questions for me? Because honestly, the interviewer is kind of just farming out the conversation to you because they don't want to deal with it. Um, so this is another good reason to look up the school beforehand, look up the people beforehand. If you know who will interview you or just look up the program of the school, have something canned. You can repeat the same question to the same to different interviewers. That's OK. Mm -hmm. um, but just be prepared for that, because that was the annoying aspect of being interviewed, I think, for two days for eight hours a day is half the time. It was just me trying to keep a conversation going. Mm -hmm. So. Definitely. Wonderful. Well, we will move on to our last sort of prepared uh, area here, the topic. And I just want to give for any of our folks that are joining us live, um, if you have any questions for Caitlin, we do, we, we should have about 10 minutes before um, six o'clock here where we're going to end. If you have any questions, please feel free to put those in the chat. Um, both Emma and I will, will watch for those questions and we will get those questions to Caitlin and ask those to her live tonight. So please feel free. So we have one more question that we have prepared um, and then we'll, we'll go on from there as well. And wonderful. And for those of you who didn't see, um, Caitlin also just put her, her, um, her email in the chat as well. Yes. So let's talk about this last piece. So in this situation, you have now gone on, you've done all the interviewing, you've applied at all the schools, and you have been given more than one offer. That is always the ideal problem to have. Mm -hmm. And I know for you, Caitlin, you were in this situation. So can you talk about, you know, we have three here. Three is really an arbitrary number, but sometimes it's nice to have something. But can you talk with us a little bit about the factors that really helped you determine what program you wanted to be at, which ultimately you chose Hopkins? Yeah, so I think um, the first thing is I have to describe a little bit about how it works for MD and MD PhD. So the way it works is you get you interview rolling basis or kind of batched, you'll get offers. Um, so when I ended my interview season in like February, I had X number of offers. There is a rule that by April 15th, you have to go down to three offers. You must uh, decline all other offers you have and go down to three. And this is to prevent, this is to help waitlist move. Um, I think medical schools have a similar rule nowadays, PA schools maybe. Um, so this is to prevent, like, I knew a couple of people that were holding on to like 10 offers at one point a few years before me, which is not fair to anyone. And like, you're not really considering all 10 schools. Um, so by April 15th, I was down to three. So I was considering three different schools. For medical school and MD, PhD and graduate school, oftentimes there's something called a second look visit. Um, I think that maybe some PA schools are starting to do this as well. Um, this is where they invite you to campus for like a day or two. Um, they usually have like activities planned. Um, they show you around the city and stuff like that. And I think the most important thing is if you're not in-person interviews, you can meet in person kind of the program director and also your cohort. Um, so for me, this kind of segues into what was most important for me at the age of 20 when I was 21, when I was choosing which program to attend. One of the biggest thing was the cohort. And so these are people that I have to stare at for eight years at least. So I really wanted to make sure that I got along with my cohort. Um, I have really deep friendships with most of my cohort. One of them officiated my wedding. Um, I'm really good friends with them. So that was a big thing for me. And you're in your 20s. You want to enjoy your time. Because it's such a long program, I think my experience is a little bit different than somebody who's going to PA school, maybe even medical school. That's a much shorter time frame. Um, for me, though, it was definitely the cohort, the program director. So you really want somebody who runs the program. So for it's called PDs for MD, PhD, and MD, or admissions deans or deans. I don't know what it's called for PA, but these are the people kind of in charge of you um, as a student of whatever degree you're in. Um, some of these directors will like go to bat for you. For example, my program director is Andrea Cox. She's an MD, PhD. She will definitely go to bat for all of her students. She's known to like, if somebody's having any issue, you can always go to her with anything and she will fix it. Um, so knowing what I know now, that was something I looked at, but even, you know, six years in, 
I think that should have been even more important to me, um, knowing what I know now. I know some PDs who do not do that for their students. So if you are facing an issue or something like that, you might just kind of be screwed. Because if you don't have a PD who's willing to put in the effort for you, that sucks. So that's a big thing. Um, if there are significant differences in like education, that's something you have to think about. For things like medical school, um, these are pretty standardized between all medical schools just because of clinical practice and being boarded, there are certain requirements. Um, but definitely the research fit for me was another big thing. So I wasn't sure what I wanted to go into when I started my my program. So I wanted to pick a school that had everything. So I wanted to pick a school that had good kind of breadth and like oncology, stem cells, cell biology. I ended up in a dermatology lab and that's probably what I'm going to go into for residency. So I got lucky. But if I had gone to a school that maybe only had oncology that was very strong, which is kind of what I did, in my summers before I joined Hopkins, um, and then I decided I didn't like it, that would have sucked too, because I kind of would have been stuck. So I think my three things were definitely the cohort fit, the PD, and then research fit. But again, this is very personal. This is going to depend on you. If you are someone with children, thinking of having children, someone with aging parents that you want to stay close to, location is going to be way more important to you, and that's okay. I love that. I love that you shared how they were personal to you and, and what those factors were. And just like you ended with on um, that, it really is a, it's, it's personal, right? That was actually how we started. Yeah. Um, you know, how did you choose? Uh, and then how do you ultimately decide that? And I just want to reemphasize that point about the people around mm -hmm. you are so critical. That is the number one reason people leave jobs is right. bosses and coworkers. Um, yeah. It's not really because they don't like their day to day necessarily, the tasks they do. It's the people that really influence our, our happiness and satisfaction at work. Yeah, I will say for, for medical school, so for anybody watching this now or later who wants to go to medical school, I do think that something that is going to significantly impact your quality of life is the grading system. Most mm -hmm. higher ranked, again, what does this actually mean in terms of how good the school is? Probably nothing, but most higher ranked schools are pass fail. I have no grades. A 70% is identical to 100%. That mm -hmm. is pass. For schools, things like medical school, which are already very, very competitive and very stressful. Um, some people have struggles with their mental health during medical school. You want to be in a place where you're going to feel supported, but also not be agonizing over whether or not you're going to get an A. Because if you have a graded system, residencies can see what grade you got and whether or not they want you, and they're going to rank you accordingly. Mm -hmm. So everything at Hopkins is pass-fail, um, which is great, except your specialty of interest clinical rotation, which is they basically just give you a good grade, essentially. Um, so that is something I really encourage people who are going to medical school or thinking about medical school to really only strongly consider pass-fail systems, if mm -hmm. at all possible. Sometimes if you're constrained geographically or for whatever reason, that might not be possible. But if you have a choice, please go to a pass-fail medical school. It makes a big difference. Hmm. Awesome. And again, this is a reason why you want to talk to people that are currently uh, candidates in a program or have graduated because that's the type of information that is hard to really gauge just from online research and you want to you want to talk with folks. So I don't see any questions in the in the chat currently. The good thing is I'm good at filling time and I have a, a question um, for you, Caitlin, that I, I think is going to actually be really important, which is how do you stay positive? How are you resilient through this very long process that feels very vulnerable and tiring and mm -hmm. all other sorts of things? Yeah, I think um, definitely, as we've discussed before, people is the most important thing. So like I started dating my now husband in college. We've been together for nine years now. Um, so he's a big rock and a reason, you know, at the end of the day, you can go home and have somebody who loves you and it, like will love you even if your experiments don't work um, and it's okay. Um, having a dog has also really helped make me get out of the house and go into nature every once in a while. Um, I think a big thing, and this is something I've discussed, my sister was a PhD student, or she has a PhD now, she's a postdoc, but something we've discussed a lot is at some point you have to start treating it like a job. Like at some point you have to say to yourself from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. I am in class or I am studying or something, but at some point you have to turn it off. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the only way you're going to be able to get through this without going completely insane, mm -hmm. um, especially for things like medical school, graduate school, PA school, there's always more to do. You can always be doing more things. You can always 
always say, oh, there's a board exam I'm going to have to take in six years. I'm going to start doing flashcards now. I know people who have done that and they burn out hard. Um, so I think for some people, what works is treating it like a job. Um, some people are able to do a little bit more kind of I'm going to do an 8 to 9 p.m. study and it's not going to destroy my life. Um, but for the most part, I tend to try and treat it like a job. Um, so I try to go, you know, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., 7 p.m., whatever. I'm in the, the tail end of my PhD, which is a lot more work right now. So it, it bleeds in a little bit and I'm definitely feeling it because I'm definitely more stressed. Um, but that would be my main advice. So find, you know, your people. It doesn't have to be a partner. It can be your friends. Um, having people who are going through the same thing as you is invaluable your cohort will be invaluable which is why it, that was a big thing for me because um sometimes the best medicine is just to complain about it um i complain constantly about my program even though i love <laughs> it um and it really does help you know that's one of my favorite parts of science is standing around the coffee maker complaining about all of your experiments for the day that's one of the best parts um and i still love doing it it's just part of the part of the process and for my program which is so so long i think it's also not considering my life paused right now. I've never thought about this as, oh, once I'm done with the MTBHD, I'll start doing this and this. I still got married. You know, we still mm -hmm. went on trips. We bought a house. Like life doesn't stop just because you're a student. So mm -hmm. just keep living your life. Don't think of it as once I get through this, I can start living because that will drive you insane. Yeah, uh, that's great. Great advice. Prioritizing your self-care and, and doing things setting boundaries with your day and your time. That's, that's a wonderful thing. And I do see we, we do have a couple questions in here. So I'll rattle these off to you. So what was the amount of hours you shadowed physicians? Um, or what, what was the amount of hours you shadowed physicians looked at in your interviews? Mm -hmm. So again, sort of, can you give a, a brief overview of kind of what shadowing looked like? Also was shadowing a requirement. Some programs shadowing is a requirement. Some mm -hmm. it's just encouraged. Yeah, I would say that it, so there are a couple different types of clinical experience, we call it, um, from the reviewing application standpoint. So shadowing is like you're following a doctor around and seeing what they do. Um, I actually didn't have that many shadowing hours because I had other clinical things as well, and I just didn't feel it was necessary. I think I had like 20 to 30 shadowing hours. I see people with hundreds of shadowing hours. Um, and my question is, what are you getting out of 100 shadowing hours versus 50 like um, you're not really going to learn medicine by shadowing people um, it's more shadowing is to me more of a way and I think most admissions people is a way to gauge if you're interested in this job mm -hmm. see the day-to-day -day, see if you like it see if it's something you could be interested in, see if you could cope with that we call it the bread and butter so like when I'm interested in dermatology I work in a dermatology lab so for example I really like looking at rare diseases, right? That's super cool. But can I deal with, could I deal with going to clinic and seeing acne and psoriasis all day? Because that is the bread and butter of that specialty. Mm -hmm. So the purpose of shadowing is to see if you like the overall kind of gestalt of the career. I don't think there's like a minimum number of shadowing hours. I would say try to get 10 to 20. I would mm -hmm. say it's great if you can do multiple different specialties. It's okay if not, but just try and get a little bit of like even two, like shadow a family practice physician and a surgeon. You could do that. I think the bigger thing is having more clinical hours, which often kind of comes together to be a big clinical experience uh, bubble, I guess. Um, so for example, I volunteered at the Aurora Hospital nearby Carroll, and I like stocked linens. And I sat at the desk in the front and kind of directed patients on what floor to go to for their appointment. Um, so that's another kind of clinical experience. Now, are you in the role of the doctor there no you're not but or like shadowing but you are kind of being exposed to the clinical environment which i think is important some schools might have guidelines in place but for the most part i would say most guidelines for things like shadowing are not hard um usually it's like we just like to see this yep and i would i would totally concur with you caitlin about i think Shadowing is more so for career exploration, making sure that you feel validated in the choice and the program that you're in, whereas where you could start to exceed is things like research opportunities, clinical hours, um, those sorts of things are where, where we can add competitiveness. Shadowing and adding additional shadowing isn't necessarily going to make you a more competitive applicant. It's also a wonderful way to network, to mm -hmm. meet physicians or meet PAs or OTs whatever those areas are. So I, I love what you what you said there. All right, we will finish with one more so we can have a hard stop at six. We have about five minutes left, so this will be perfect. Okay, so you chatted about extracurricular 
extracurriculars and hobbies, um, which were important, do you recommend having a lot or being in, uh, very involved in a select few? That is a great question. This is actually really easy. Definitely being very involved in a select few is better, 100%. Um, I've never seen someone with 10 experiences that I viewed more favorably than someone with three that were more in depth. Because mm -hmm. to me and other people, it's kind of like, well, are you just checking boxes to try and mm -hmm. seem like you're interested in lots of things or to try and seem like you do all these things? You, Everybody only has so many hours in a day. Um, so it's really more about have you kind of been more involved in this? So like if you volunteered for five hours for one thing versus having volunteered for something for 150 hours over two years that's a really big difference mm -hmm. um, and we would much rather see people who've had like a long-term committed thing and this goes for research as well uh, long-term lab experiences long-term kind of faculty uh, research assistant experiences stuff like that definitely having fewer that you're more involved with it would viewed more favorably Perfect. Love that answer. Well, Caitlin, mm -hmm. is there is there anything else that we haven't chatted about or any sort of piece of advice that you'd like to leave our, our viewers with? Yeah, I think um, the main thing is I was actually told that I wasn't going to get into good places because I came from Carroll University, which I think is not true. Um, I actually had a PD tell me this um, from a kind of middling research university, a good university, but told me I wouldn't get in anywhere basically and that I should kind of only strive for very small programs and not even any PhD. Um, it gets kind of boring when the whole cohort is from Hopkins, Harvard, or Yale. Um, people don't like that. People love to see diverse experiences. Your education is not worth any less because you came from a small school in Wisconsin. Um, you are just as well trained. I outscored many people on the MCAT from my training at Carroll. So I think that would be my main thing is I think some people are afraid to kind of reach outside what they typically see. And a lot of people at Carroll want to stay in the area, and that's perfectly fine. I understand that. But if you're someone who's interested in going outside, going to the East Coast, the West Coast, I think just give it a shot. I was never disparaged in any interview for having gone somewhere. Everyone was like, oh, that's really cool. Where is that? And that was often a starting off point. So that would be my main thing is I think a lot of people are discouraged from the fact that they went to Carroll University. It's not a bad thing. I think people like having the diversity aspect of having people who didn't go to one of the Ivies or one of the giant research universities that contribute a lot of students to these different programs because you have a unique experience just from going to a smaller place. Yeah, I love it. That's that's fantastic. Yeah, that we can really look at your Carol experience as a strength and not yeah. a weakness. That's mm -hmm. wonderful. Well, thank you, Caitlin. I There was so many good pieces in here. I might have to rewatch it myself to right. just keep reiterating. So that's wonderful. Yes. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Emma right. to close us out. Thank you both so very much for your time. And everybody else who joined, um, we're very lucky to have had both Caitlin and Lydia here. Caitlin, you gave really incredible advice, specific, helpful. And Lydia, the questions you asked were fantastic. And the follow-up too, I want to say, um, if you are a current student, obviously um, you can meet with Lydia, but also if you are an alumna or alumnus, or even if you're a current student, when you graduate, you can use career services for life. So that means, you know, if down the road you want some interview help, you change careers and or you want to change your career and want advice on that, um, suggestions on your resume, any of the above, you know, it, there's and as you can see, Lydia is an incredible resource. And then what's also fantastic is Caitlin's provided her information. Um, so if you do have those specific questions you think of later, or you just didn't want to ask at this point, um, you can certainly always reach out to either of the two of them. Uh, I just want to make one other quick note that at the end of March, we are having two webinars. Um, one is uh, led by Ann Lotch, who is the Alumni Council Chair, um, and she's doing renting your first apartment. And then a week later uh, is first time home buying. So, and that's led by uh, Matt Dedman, who is a graduate of 2001. Um, so if those are either topics that you're interested in, we hope to see you back then. Any Anything else, Lydia, Caitlin, you want to... No problem. Yeah. Again, happy to, I've read hundreds of personal statements. I'm um, just to have another pair of eyes. So happy to do that. Happy to chat. Just shoot me an email. I'm still in the PhD, which means I still have some free time. So <laughs> wonderful. And I will just offer for any of our rewatchers. So if they didn't see 
the chat live with Caitlin's email. We can put my Carol email in our uh, YouTube description and folks can reach out to me and I will pass along Caitlin's email. So we'll do a, a, a little bit of a, of a segue there. So Caitlin's not getting random emails <laughs> from YouTube watchers. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I, I guess I didn't even consider that. <laughs> Well, thank you, everyone. You have a wonderful evening. Thanks again for your time. <laughs> thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks,